So uh, today, hi, I'm Maxim, and I'm going to be talking about uh, bringing JavaScript to Android and using it for Android native development. Um, I'm going to be talking about both <laughs> the good bits uh, that I've learned doing this, the not so good bits, and potentially what can be a bit less ugly in the future when I'm in using. Um, if I could just have a quick show of hands to know roughly how much detail to go into. Who's done any kind of Android development at all or could recognize Android? So, oh my god, okay. I was expecting far less hands. And uh, how about with JavaScript? How's... Okay, just enough to read it. Cool, that's about all we need. I will try not to go into too many details. Now, I guess the question is why I'd want to do this. Well, for the last year or so, I've been working on a... Uh, a project to build an Android uh, digital appliance to do interactive signage. Now, the problem with that is that you want to be able to do some testing. Oh, before I tell you a bit more about that, I guess I should answer the question, what is interactive digital signage apart from a huge mouthful? And it's this sort of thing, yes, very cool, especially the Nokia screen. So it's basically this kind of interactive kiosk that you see at shopping centres, shops, um, airports, wherever you need people to interact with some signage. And if you're interested to find out a bit more about it, I'll actually be talking uh, more about how to do this with Android uh, later on this afternoon in another talk I'm doing. Now, with the app that I was building, because it's for digital signage, it's pretty much like a popular website. People look at it all the time, it's in public view, so like a popular website, it's really not an option to just let the device, uh, let the app crash or the device bring up an error message because like, like with popular websites, that's really not what you want people who are using it to see. Then again, it seems to work for some websites, so <laughs> perhaps it's not such a big deal for interactive signage, except it is. Because when people come into your store and they see that, that's not a really good look. They might not know what it is, but they know that's not right. Now, um, before we all start sort of sniggering under our, our breaths at people using Windows, it happens to everybody. So yes, little did I know that Maccas uses Ubuntu. So it's definitely not a good look whichever operating system you're using. So you need to do some stress testing. Now, the issue with uh, doing this kind of testing with the standard Android testing framework, if any of you have used it, is that it's not really meant for this. Uh, the framework's built to do unit testing, integration testing, making sure things, your app works uh, well with other apps or the system components. It's not really built to do long-running stress tests, the kind that will expose issues like a slow memory leak or something that goes wrong after the app's been running for a few hours or even a few days. So that's where uh, Rhino comes in, or in fact uh, JavaScript, because what I decided to use was something called Mozilla, uh, Rhino, which is from Mozilla. It's a JavaScript engine that they've written in Java. So unlike its more well-known counterparts like Spider, Spider Monkey, which sits inside Firefox, or V8, which Google uses in Chrome, uh, Mozilla's Rhino was supposed to be, I think, meant to be used in a whole suite of Java products that um, back in the Netscape days they were going to switch over to and never happened. But the good news is that what was left over was this really um, quite nice uh, JavaScript engine that you can use to embed in your own Java applications if you want to be able to use JavaScript. Now what really got me um, thinking about this was when I needed this around I think it was April or so last year, I'd seen earlier in the year um, this tweet by Hans Wolfner, who's one of the maintainers these days of Rhino, and he's also uh, previously written a server-side JavaScript framework way before Node ever burst onto the scene and became popular, that I'd used for quite a while and I really like. So this gave me a bit of confidence that trying this out in project, even though it was not for production application, it was for testing a production application would actually work out. Now before I go into actually showing you quickly how JavaScript um, works with 
Android. I should actually give you, just, just for those who don't have much of a background in Android, but I'm glad to see quite a few do, I'll give you a quick, basic intro to Android app development in about 60 seconds, so I'm going to talk really quickly. <laughs> so, basically, Android is a framework, not a library. So what that means is they follow the Hollywood principle. You don't get to call, well, you don't, you don't call out um, primarily to the operating system's libraries, the, the operating system calls you. You define functions or methods, if you like, which the, uh, the, the operating system will call at specific times. Now, one of the key th things in an Android application is an activity or activities. It ba an activity basically represents the things that you see on the screen at one time. And activities, like a, because this is a framework, they have a particular life cycle. A life cycle means sp at specific points in time, your code will get called by the operating system. So when the user launches your application, that's a particular point where st stuff can happen. When they leave it to go to another application or uh, actually another activity, other part, another f uh, method will get called, that sort of thing. So yeah, activities have a, sp a very specific life cycle where your code runs at very specific points in time. Services are basically what you want if you need things to keep running because, because of the life cycle of activities, when you, your activity leaves the screen, it stops running. If you want things to happen, can t keep running in the background, this is what services are for. They're, they don't have um, typically any kind of user interface to interact with the user. What they do is things in the background. So if you're used to Unix system daemons, th that's a kind of an analog. They do things in the background and they actually have to take special, uh, they have to use special means to communicate with the um, activity that's running in the foreground or to notify the user through other methods like notifications. Again, services have a, f a life cycle of their own as well. Now, intents are really like, you can think of them as a message bus, but they're really what makes Android Android. They are the heart of Android. So intents are a messaging system or process communication system that lets the different components on an Android device communicate with each other. And they use, they're also used to pass control from one component to another. That's, I guess, the key thing with Android is it's made up of these cooperating components, if you like, and they, it just so happens that a set of components is bundled in what people think of an application, but they're really, with, even within an application, there are these discrete components that need to communicate with each other. Activities, services, be they yours, be they the operating systems or another, uh, or ones provided by another application. Now, the thing to know about intents is essentially they're a message which has an action and some data associated with it. They're, um, they're a little bit structured in the fact that there's these specific fields, if you like. So, the, uh, intent has an action field, it has a uh, data field, has extra uh, data fields, but they're really only strings in the end. So, there's Say an action, there's a, there can be an action for uh, viewing something or for editing. And these are just basically standard actions, if you like, that are predefined by the Android SDK. There are others that you can just basically, you can just basically define whatever you like because in the end, they're just a string which is supposed to follow a particular namespacing convention to differentiate it because they need to be unique on a particular device. And when you want to, basically the flip side of that is when you want to know when an event's been fired by some other um, component, you, you essentially register to receive these intents using filters, which are, are like a prerequisite that needs to be matched for an intent to be delivered to your activity or service. So say you might want to register, you want, might want to know any time uh, the user tries to open a URL that goes to, L the LCA website. You can basically, re your app can then say, I want to receive intents which uh, have a MIME type of a uh, URL and they match this particular pattern, lca.org, whatever, and then your um, activity, for instance, or service will get um, woken up and notified that this uh, intent has been launched somehow and then you can deal with it and in, in whichever way you want to. So for instance, you might want to bring up a notification saying, hey, there's a new schedule on the LCA website or something. 
And that's it. So that's a really, really quick rushed overview, hopefully enough to give you an understanding of the concepts in Android so that when I show you some um, code, you'll have a better understanding of what it does. So onto the code. Um, this is a chunk that I took out of one of my um, stress tests and what I'll do is I'll just quickly go through it um, bit by bit and try and explain the different sections and what they do in terms of how you can use JavaScript um, to write an Android application. Uh, I should point out that essentially this is not, this is not a cross-platform uh, way of writing applications because there are other um, frameworks and products out there that let you do that kind of thing like you write your um, your application code to a particular API that um, they, they try and make cross-platform so that your app ca you can basically create a package of your app that runs on Android another one that runs on iOS another one that might run using Adobe Flash or Air or something Th this is basically uh, the opposite of that it, it, it's essentially using the standard Android APIs, but from JavaScript rather than using Java. Now, the first part is basically a way of saving typing. JavaScript doesn't have, like for those of you who know a little bit of Java, Java has an import uh, mechanism in the language. You, you don't have the same thing in JavaScript, so just to make life a bit easier because you're calling into the Java API, which has these uh, a really large namespace. So this is actually reasonably short. Something like android.content.intent means a package, um, you've got the package name is android.content and there's a class called intent that you want to use. So I've seen <laughs> uh, package names easily, five, six um, levels deep if you like, sub package uh, levels deep. So it can get really verbose if you don't do, don't do this kind of thing. Your code will just be reams and reams of text. So but that's all it is, it's nothing fancy, it's just basically aliasing the names of those classes so you can refer to them later in your code. This is one of the kind of key bits of using uh, this JS Droid as it was called, this project's called, to write Android applications because what it does is essentially lets you use the JavaScript um, mechanisms for registering callbacks in a fairly natural and intuitive way if you're used to doing any kind of programming in a browser, JavaScript browser, programming in a JavaScript, programming JavaScript in a browser or uh, something like Node.js. So essentially what, you're, what, what this bit of um, code says is that when you receive a, on receiving a broadcast, so uh, one thing I skipped over was that intents come in two forms, they're kind of uh, unicast or broadcast, so you can send an intent uh, to a specific uh, a component or you can just send what's called a broadcast intent which is saying anyone who's registered for this will receive it. So for instance the system will send broadcast intents when the battery level changes or when you drop in and out, drop off a Wi-Fi network or you go from Wi-Fi to being on 3G network, dating network, that kind of thing. So th this, these two lines say when, you, when this application receives an int a broadcast and intent that it's registered for, just call this code. Uh, here you can see, as I mentioned before, you, intents have actions. So here what you just do is, you, based on the action that you received, you choose a particular path in a switch statement. And the, the third line is showing you that you get, you get if you want to get the, um, the data that was associated with that intent, you, you can just basically pull that out. So, for instance, one of the things that uh, I, I needed to test for my application was the signage um, app would talk to a server because it, what, what it did was actually display web content and it would, in order to know what web content it needed to display, it would ping a particular URL to get a manifest of URLs it wanted to display. Now, one thing I wanted to test was what happened when you switch that backwards and forwards over a long period of time. And in order to do that, I needed to be able to detect when the application would switch between displaying one piece of content and another. So all I did was I had the application send a broadcast intent to anything that was registered saying, hey, I'm now displaying this piece of content. 
Now, it proved it was, I, I needed to do it for this testing, but actually turned out to be quite handy because I could then create another application that, or component, if you like, that just sat there and listened to these. So then, if um, because a lot of these um, signage networks need to do things like keep track of how many times or for how long particular content was played. So, for instance, for things like billing. So, if it's an advertiser, they want to know their ad was shown X many times, an hour for this many hours. That that's really easy to then uh, add onto the application because the broadcast intent essentially flags that every time. A different piece of uh, content, so a different URL is being displayed by the um, sign. Any, any um, application that's installed on the device that was registered to receive these intents would be notified. So that covers. Oh, sorry. So that. So the key thing that I wanted to cover there was those callbacks because I, I've probably been harping on about it, but Android being a framework. Everything revolves around you getting callbacks from the operating system to tell you something's happened or something's changed. So you get a callback on uh, the start of your, actually when your uh, application gets created or loaded up, if you like, when it gets when it gets started, when it's displayed on screen, if it's um, paused because the user has switched to some, something else, like they received a notification. So handling these uh, events is really crucial to any Android application you write. So having a really nice way to do this in JavaScript um, makes a big difference. And that's one thing that put me off um, previous efforts that I'd seen to use JavaScript uh, with Android was the fact that they didn't really uh, make a big effort to handle that usage because in other applications of uh, Java, like if you write if you write web applications with Java, that is not the normal way um, your code's run. Your code works the same way as desktop applications. It just basically starts up, it runs, it, it's just left there running, it does what, it's, what it wants. With Android, it's the other way around. You just basically get notified, at, it's, it's very uh, event driven. So you only get notified at particular times when things happen. So if, you're, if the JavaScript framework doesn't take that into account and makes it really easy to uh, deal with that, way, that aspect of um, creating Android applications, it, it really makes life quite difficult and it, it, it's harder than it needs to be in terms of writing apps. Oh, thanks. Oh, better speed up. Um, also, of course, I needed to be able to, like, as I said, talk to servers. And the, the thing with the JS Droid project was it was actually called JS Droid Demo. It was really a technology demo <laughs> done to show how, how these, these particular things could be built. But that was the extent of it. And something as crucial as doing uh, HTTP requests wasn't in there. I, I could have just basically called out to the standard Android libraries, but that would have meant that if I wanted to use any of the existing JavaScript code, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do so because pretty much all JavaScript code is written expecting, well, apart, all, all the client-side ones that are written for browsers expect that you have the XHR object to do um, HTTP requests. So I, I managed to find um, uh, implementation of the XHR object for Rhino and then just was able to tweak it and modify it a little bit to make it work nicely in Android. And it meant that if I wanted to, I could just use existing bits of front-end JavaScript code that um, used that API and I didn't have to modify any of them. Now. That was all well and good, and I, may, I managed to get it to work, and it did what I needed to do. Found plenty of bugs that only happened when it was running on for a while. It actually uncovered some server-side bugs as well, as in, luckily I wasn't um, responsible for those, but it, it, it did its job. The thing is, I wasn't actually very satisfied with programming or writing the test in that way. I thought using a lightweight language like JavaScript would let me quickly develop these tests, tweak them as I went along, because it wasn't a production app. This needed to change quickly. New requirements would come in really rapidly, or I'd find bugs and I need to test for like the consequences of those bugs. It didn't work out that way. First off, I was still doing 
the development of the device, just like I would if I was writing the program in Java. I was editing the JavaScript and then pushing it onto the device every time. There wasn't that really nice, quick uh, feedback loop of make a change, see it, edit, make a change, see it, edit again. Because every time, it was, it, there wasn't a compile step, but essentially it might as well have been because I was having to push the JavaScript onto the device every time or go through the laborious process of trying to have something that watched the files and put, push the JavaScript across onto the device or the emulator that I was using. The other problem was port tooling. Now, a lot of people give um, Java heaps of flack, but using it for Android development is actually not so bad, I found, because the tooling support is really good. Navigating through the code is actually really nice. You get auto-completion support. You get inline documentation for all the API help that's uh, in, uh, in an API like the Android SDK. So not having that in JavaScript made it really actually quite painful, I realised, when I switched over to do um, development of even these straightforward tests because basically e even picking up on things like in incorrect spelling of classes and things, which is just a really basic thing that the Java uh, environment or even the compiler will give you didn't happen when I was writing the scripts in JavaScript. Okay, so, but, so basically what happened was I, I discovered this, but someone else, um, a guy called Tim Bray, who's now at Google, uh, had come across this very same thing and written a blog post about it. And he basically thought that th the reason why you'd want to or not want to use a dynamic language versus a static language is the size of the API you're dealing with. And believe me, anyone who's dealt with Android and a bunch of other third-party libraries knows it's absolutely gigantic. So. What I thought about was what kind of things would need to be done to actually make this kind of development better. On-device development seemed to be key, but I didn't know whether it was actually even possible and I had a lot, a lot of other work to do. So basically mid last year I set this aside and I only came back to it late um, in the late last year when I started thinking about what would it take to actually be able to do serious development on one of these small devices. Now the problems actually, like I said, solved on desktops you have these IDEs but that that's Eclipse is not going to work on something that's 10 inch or even 4 inch I'm, like you don't have a 42 inch monitor but a lot of people have two say 24 inch monitors or something side by side and that development is really nice for a big idea like that it's not going to work on a small device so apart from better tools we would need better IDEs uh, sorry better tool tooling for small devices rather than IDEs so I, I ended up actually coming across a project from, I think it's a South Australian developer on iOS f to develop apps on Lua on iOS, as it were. And he's actually solved, or at least attempted to solve, a lot of these issues in his uh, uh, environment because he'd have specialised editing tools which made use of the touch screen to be able to, for instance, uh, select images or colours or fonts, inline help and quick previews so you get that nice rapid uh, feedback cycle while you're developing on the device. And so this is where I've started a new project which is essentially not a fork of Jesuit but just basically trying to actually make it into a workable product rather than just a demo to try and actually have a serious development environment using JavaScript on a device that's 10 inch or even 4 inch. Now, I've got it basically at a demo stage, as it were, at the moment. It's up on um, GitHub if anyone wants to uh, help out. There's still a lot of things to do. The main thing I want to explore is actually what it would take to have a really nice, competent development environment on a device which you normally don't have a keyboard for or you don't want to use a keyboard for very much, where you actually exploit the fact that it is a multi-touch device with a potentially high resolution screen. This is some of the aspects actually that um, B. Dale talked about this morning and where I actually have, don't quite agree with him is that I think these devices are the future for everyone except potentially niche audiences which unfortunately for this audience I think we're pretty much all the niche for um, clamshell or desktop uh, general purpose computing devices. For the majority of people, these new touchscreen tablets or phones are going to be the computer devices. And it would actually be really nice if there was a proper development environment for them, not just for them to be 
just uh, consumer devices focused specifically at consuming media or uh, using games and applications. And I will finish there because I think I'm out of time. Uh, yeah, about three minutes. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions or do we want to have a discussion, say, during lunch? Because we're just going to get through several maps before lunch. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you are familiar with the AID Android Java IDE, which runs on uh, Android tablets and stuff, and is a full kind of Android Java IDE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's from a German company. H I believe so, yeah. yeah. I have it actually installed. It's a reasonable $10, so. Uh, yeah. but, um, but the problem is, is I think they've taken, why, I, I quite was interested at first, but this is some of the issues that I brought up is actually, I think it's a good exemplar of, I don't mean to be mean to them, but they try and do kind of like a cut down IDE on a small device. And I found even just browsing my code, I had to constantly flick between closing their small file browser and the code view, because even that doesn't fit very well on it. And I've got a 10 inch um, Retina uh, Nexus tablet, which is about as good as you can get hardware wise. And it's still really quite painful to use. I tried to do a little bit of development on it just to dog food it to see for how it would go. And I have to say, I don't think it's the right paradigm for these devices. I think it's bringing something that's really good on a laptop or a netbook and trying to cram it onto a touch device, not making the best use of the big touch screen that's right there in front of you. Okay. All right, we might wrap, just hold questions over because we've got several maps to go through. Paul, who's doing several maps? Andrew's reading that one. Okay, Andrew will be doing several maps. Do you need to pick up anything? Or... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt.